Sandra Roberts. I'm Director of Sales for Cade, Plump Jack, and Odette. And I'm here today at Cade 13th Vineyard with the talented winemaker, Danielle Soro, because today is International Sauvignon Blanc Day. And we thought we ought to drink some Sauvignon Blanc on a Friday evening with you. There Cheers. you go. Cheers. Now, I have to tell you something sad. Our 19 Sauvignon Blanc in our glass, hopefully in yours, is almost sold out. It's not a bad thing. Well, <laughs> the reason it's sold out is because it's delicious. Danielle, tell me what, what's the secret? What's the secret sauce? Well, the secret sauce, in my opinion, is the vineyards, of course. So we're sourcing from all over Napa Valley. Hope Valley, St. Helena, Howell Mountain, Oakville, Oak Knoll, and all of those different um, sub appellations of Napa Valley really lend itself to a lot of different fruits that you get in the glass. So Pope Valley is more peachy tropical. Um, St. Helena has more kind of yellow apple, banana. And as you move down valley, you get more of the grapefruit, citrus, lemon lime. And Howell Mountain is actually just pineapple. It's really, mm. really cool. So I'm just trying to capture all of those flavors in the glass um, because Sauvignon Blanc is so diverse in that way. You can get all of these different flavors and aromas, and I just want to preserve that and, and have it um, shine in the glass for you and well, wow you. I think, well, I'm wild. I'm definitely <laughs> wild. But I think one of the things that's so neat about the Napa Valley that I never really understood, I grew up in Mississippi, where it got hot in March and it cooled off about November. Um, here in the Napa Valley, it can be what, five to 10 degrees cooler in the south versus the north? Absolutely. So when I think about Sauvignon Blanc in a southern climate, a uh, cooler site, is that kind of more grapefruity, more bright citrus? And as you move north, what happens? You just get a little bit more of those um, ripe yellow and orange fruits, if you will. Um, you can sometimes get a, even into the cantaloupe and peachy mm. um, mango, but I don't want to push it too far. I really like the bright acidity, um, almost that minerality and that leanness sometimes, and I can bring in some, some texture and roundness with uh, barrel fermentation, which we do, do about 10% barrel ferment. Um, and then I can bring in a little bit um, other elements because we blend in some Viognier and some Semillon into this. So, um, but yes, the cooler Sauvignon Blanc is very grapefruit, lemon, lime. And as you move north, you get a little bit more um, just riper mm -hmm. uh, flavors. Well, it makes sense to me. I've had it one time in Colorado at a wonderful restaurant in Denver, and he did a grill salad with ricotta and peach sprang out of this glass. And then I've also had it, of course, in New Orleans, Louisiana with a fried shrimp po' boy. <laughs> and it was like squeezing a lemon on top. That really speaks to the diversity of this wine. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, what about concrete eggs and all that kind of thing? I've yes. Heard rumors. Well, I've seen them in the cellar, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> well, yes. So the majority of this wine is fermented in stainless steel tanks, like the ones behind us here, just a little bit smaller. Um, and then a, a portion of the juice is fermented in new French oak and neutral French oak barrels. So about 10% of the juice is fermented in barrel, which gives a texture and a creaminess to the wine. And then a very small portion, but a little bit of the juice is fermented in concrete. Um, and concrete eggs, um, they really are a shape of an egg. Mm -hmm. They hold about 160 gallons of juice. And what you get is this um, purity of fruit as if you're fermenting in stainless steel. So there's um, just this great pure aroma, but you get a textural component because the juice, because of the shape of the, the fermenter, the juice is turning and mixing, and um, that gives a, a texture, a creaminess, a yogurt, kind of um, creme brulee type uh, texture to the wine, which is really intriguing and just another element of complexity in the overall blend. So we have five concrete eggs. Um, it's a small portion, but it actually has a, a big impact, I think, on um, the aromas and flavors of the wine to me too because of course 
Sometimes Sauvignon Blancs can get a bit too angular, and uh, I don't know. I've gotten heartburn from Sauvignon Blanc. <laughs> this one has never given me heartburn, but it has gotten me into trouble, Danielle. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, it does go down very easily, but, you know, <laughs> you, you have to watch yourself sometimes. Um, and on a hot summer day, it is a great wine to be enjoying. Well, so. I will say, you know the trouble with trouble. What's the trouble with trouble? It starts out as fun. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> mm, delicious. Thank you. Mm. I don't want to sound too much like a sales lady, but seriously, get it while you can. Now, there's some folks behind us. There we were are. thinking, what can we do creatively uh, on International Sauvignon Blanc Day? And we thought, how about a grill off? Perfect. So I want to introduce our volunteer grill masters. Mrs. Christine Mason, she's Yay. our marketing manager extraordinaire. She's so much more than that. And Anthony, who is, what are you grading back there? Romano cheese. A little Romano cheese. Now, we stole him from one of our restaurant customers in St. Louis, Missouri. Bartolino's. And uh, we're so happy to have him here. Bartolino's. We're so happy to have him here with us. And they volunteered to each cook a meal, a dish, to see which one would pair best with our Sauvignon Blanc. Anthony, what are you going to cook? I'm going to make an asparagus crab cake, but it's going to be mostly based with eggs. So it's going to be like a little egg patty, um, stuffed with some fresh Maine crab meat, um, shaved asparagus, a little bit of uh, a citrus sesame aioli. That should be, that should be all right. And some crisp, crisped up uh, pancetta for a little... Saltiness. I like it. That sounds, sounds great. Mm -hmm. And how about you, Miss Christine? Well, you guys heard he's from the restaurant world, so he's going to be a little fancier than me, but I am doing your classic fish tacos with a cod um, marinated in some olive oil and salt, a little Cajun because I like mine spicy, and then um, I've got some shishito peppers over here, which I'm going to griddle up and top it with, um, and a little bit of kind of coleslaw, uh, mix and then um, a mango peach tropical salsa now that does not sound simple mm -hmm. they both sound amazing should we um should now they have 30 minutes to create these dishes danielle should we uh should we give it a go i think so lady and gentlemen start your grill boom all right i'm super excited about this now danielle the question i get the most out in the world is do you make two Sauvignon Blancs at Cade? I do. So we make an estate Sauvignon Blanc. Um, is that which here? Th the big glass here, yes. Um, which is um, from our uh, property in Oakville at Plump Jack. So when we bought Cade in the property uh, in 2005, we had um, only red grapes planted at Cade. Cabernet Sauvignon and at that time... We really wanted to do a, a white wine uh, for Cade, and there was actually a, a block at Plump Jack, our sister property, um, that was kind of underperforming. And um, I think it was planted to Merlot at the time, and um, it just wasn't making reserve quality fruit. And so we decided to plant Sauvignon Blanc, um, Sauvignon Mousquet, Viognier, and Semillon in that block. It, so that uh, it, in Oakville. In so, Oakville, yes. I mean, this is something I think that's important. I know we're not talking about Plump Jack today or, or Cabernet, but that's a vineyard in Oakville, which is one of the most sought-after places to grow Cabernet. And we chose to grow Sauvignon Blanc in one of those um, pieces because it wasn't great at Cabernet. Right. And we put, put Merlot because Merlot likes wet feet, according to everybody. Right. But that Merlot didn't. And so it's not often that you um, find a vineyard in Oakville that's willing to rip out Merlot or Cabernet to plant Sauvignon Blanc. That's right. a commitment to, to excellence, isn't it? Right. And also, um, you know, we could actually crop it so there was a little bit more fruit. Um, even though we're paying a little bit less for that fruit, if you will, we can get three to four tons to the acre of Sauvignon Blanc, whereas Cabernet Sauvignon, we're looking at more like two tons, maybe two and a half tons to the acre. So, so there was some compensation there as well, but it's an amazing, amazing spot for Sauvignon Blanc. 
Um, and so we've got two, two, actually three clones of Sauvignon Blanc, clone one and clone six Sauvignon Blanc, and the Sauvignon Musquet clone. And the Musquet clone gives a real pretty oh. floral note to the wine. Um, and this wine is uh, fermented mostly in concrete and then um, about 30% barrel ferment. And I pick very lightly toasted barrels, um, almost blonde toast, because I really want the Sauvignon Blanc aromas to be preserved. Mm -hmm. I don't want an oaky, charry kind of, you know, cover all those beautiful aromatics because right. of the barrel. The barrel is really there to bring some texture and density and weight um, to the Sauvignon Blanc, but still maintain that nice, bright acidity. I'm um, getting a little spicy pepper. Is that from the oak or is that from the fruit? probably from the oak, yeah. Mm. It's delicious. Yeah, so I'm really, um, and then a little bit of Viognier and Semillon blended in as well. So the Viognier um, also brings in a floral note, but almost like a honeysuckle, orange mm -hmm. blossom mm -hmm. uh, note. I pick it pretty ripe, um, so you get some of that oiliness and, and um, richness. Um, but the Semillon is kind of the counterpoint to the Viognier because the Semillon has a little bit more of a kiwi, um, green apple, cucumber, almost um, aroma to it, a, a very bright acidity, and I pick it at much lower sugars, around 20 bricks, maybe 21 bricks, which equals about 12% alcohol. Okay. So you get that, um, almost the semillon kind of cuts the Viognier in half, but it's bringing another element of complexity and aroma and depth of flavor um, to the overall blend. But the Estate Sauvignon Blanc is definitely a little bit more um, richer. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit bolder mm -hmm. um, because the barrel, because of the concrete, because of um, just trying to, one, make the two wines taste different, um, but really showcase what the Plum Jack Oakville estate property can bring to the table. And I have to tell you, it's the best Sauvignon Blanc I've ever worked with. The, just tasting the grapes, you're just like, oh my gosh, these grapes are so flavorful. There's so much intensity. Well, I mean, you can't find really Oakville Sauvignon Blanc anymore, can you? Mm -mm. I mean, Everybody wants Cabernet, oh, right. so, yeah. Well, I mean, I heard a rumor, too, that you had to arm wrestle with Aaron Miller, our winemaker, <laughs> to get the Viognier, is that right? Every year he threatens to, to <laughs> pick the Viognier so he can co-ferment it with his Syrah. Um, and every year I tell him, don't touch it, it's mine. <laughs> and then I go and make sure that all of the grapes are picked in my bins and they don't go to any plump jack bins. Nah, I'm just kidding. But well, in case he's watching, Aaron, Aaron, you cannot have <laughs> your wine. No, from, you can't have oh, the it's ours. It's, it's ours. In, it's ours here at Cape. I'd be happy to give you the pressed off skins. Yeah. So. <laughs> I bet. Well, <laughs> man, it smells good behind me. Should we go see what they're doing? I think so. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. And y'all, we do have a uh, live studio audience for the first time. Live studio audience. All the way from Brooklyn and Napa Valley. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> oh, it smells so good over Ooh. here, y'all. What are you doing? What are you doing? You, now, you didn't mention Shishito's. I think I did. I think I did. Oh, shoot. Yeah, well... Either way, this is my specialty dish of the whole thing. The rest of it, I'm not really sure. But um, right now, I'm browning my butter. So I'm about to dump my uh, my fish chunks into it um, to and get it's those. Cod. It's cod. Yes. Now, has it been marinating for very long? No, maybe maybe two hours. Okay. It's just you know, you don't want to. I don't know, over marinate a fish. Do I know that for sure? Not really, but. <laughs> now she's our. I, I mentioned she's our marketing manager. <laughs> Um, not a trained professional chef. So you can do this at home. <laughs> That's true. You can do this. At, I will share my recipe. Um, I do love the Blackstone griddle. I've been using it all through a quarantine, and uh, it's been my best friend. So You're not being paid to promote. Not exactly. Griddle, I'm so. hoping someday, but <laughs> <laughs> for now, you know, this is what we have going on. Well, I can't so. wait to try it. Anthony. Yes, ma'am. What are you? What are you doing over we're, here? We're just crisping up some pancetta here, um, and this is just going to kind of add a nice little salty aspect with a little bit of crunch to the dish, um, and it makes it kind of like bacon and eggs. Ooh. So it'll kind of be like breakfast or brunch, which is kind of awesome. I like it. Um, so yeah, that's where we're at now. And then I have 
my my crab cake mix there, and I'm just gonna brown those up here. Once these are finished, we'll be ready to go. Sounds good. Yeah. Any questions, Danielle? Yeah. Well, for both of you, when we when we came up with this, when Christine came up with this brilliant idea to do a cook-off for International Sauvignon Blanc Day, did you go? I have a perfect recipe that pairs perfectly with Sauvignon Blanc. Or did you go, gosh, let me taste this and see what kind of flavors I want to pull out in the wine? You know, I think when I think Sauvignon Blanc, when I think your Sauvignon Blanc, I can drink it with anything, uh, a swimming pool, my backyard, my dog. <laughs> but I also think about fish. Yeah. So um, fish tacos just really spoke to me, maybe because yesterday or a couple days ago was Cinco de Mayo. Yeah. Um, and... I just, I think that the, the texture, the light texture of the fish, the light body texture of your wine, all the, the multiple layers of your wine, as well as the tropical notes, which I think will go well with the tropical fruits I have in your salsa, um, a little bit of that minerality just to kind of tie it all together. Um, all, of, all of that really is what kind of inspired me, and I think it's just a beautiful day here in the valley because we're so lucky. Um, so. That's what I came up with. That was my inspiration and the fact that I have a griddle. I thought, you know, let's, let's make it all happen. All right. <laughs> Sounds good. What about you, Anthony? Um, I like... I know it. <laughs> I like to uh, pair the Sauvignon Blanc a lot with some kind of Asian flavors. So okay. That's why we're doing the toasted sesame aioli. Um, there's a little bit of soy sauce mixed into the batter. I think that that pairs really well yeah. with the acidity. Um, I also love it with some green vegetables, so I think asparagus now when they're fresh is kind of an awesome pairing as well. So mm -hmm. we just kind of tied all that together. Um, and this was a recipe that my mom's been making forever, and I think she got it from my grandma. So it's something that I was familiar with from all our family parties, things like that. So it was an easy, easy choice for me. Awesome. Now, did you grow up in St. Uh, St. Louis cooking in the restaurants, or just at home with your with um, your family? Mostly cooking at home. After college, I did some cooking at the restaurant and, and did that way. Um, but yeah, when I was younger, I pretty much just watched and learned. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, I was impressed after your uh, video that you did for us making pasta. Well, fresh pasta, yeah. Ooh, that was yeah. good. Absolutely. That was good. Well, thank y'all. I will all get right. out of your way. Okay. Uh, we'll those let, girls are smoking. <laughs> we'll let your grill. <laughs> Live audience. Do you have any questions from Facebook? Well, uh, maybe we should talk about the 2020 vintage. Yes. So... You guys that have been with us uh, over the last, gosh, year, well, has, since we've been doing Facebook Live, some of you may know that uh, we did not make 2020 reds. Why did you make 2020 reds, Danielle? Well, we had not one but two uh, serious fires in Napa Valley um, during harvest. So the first one was the LNU complex, which basically was started um, by some lightning, um, freak lightning storm in August, and um, the end of August, and um, we were um, evacuated from the winery uh, for about, I believe it was uh, 10 days, so um, I had picked some Sauvignon Blanc already for the That ignited fires in just the worst time for for white wine. I mean, you so right. you had picked one of one or two of the vineyards for Sauvignon Blanc. We had picked Blanc. the Pope Valley fruit and a little um, no, actually just the Pope Valley fruit. But I had scheduled picks um, to come in basically the the week that the fire started. So because the winery was evacuated and we didn't have access to it, um, Plump Jack opened up their doors and wow. said, bring the fruit here and we'll press it and, and hold it for you until you guys can get back up to Cade. So, so was that fire more, but more uh, up here near Howe Mountain? Yeah, it was kind of um, valley. And the back side. The back side, but actually a little bit south. Totally spacing on the name now. On the other um, side of the mountain, just south. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, 
kind of like where Chapelet is and yeah. Pritchard Hill, yeah. kind of over there. So, um, and around um, Berryessa mm -hmm. and Lake Hennessee was kind of where that was. So, anyway, um, we, we pressed and um, brought in the majority of the Sauvignon Blanc um, and did it at Plump Jack with their team, which was awesome. Amazing. Um, so we all worked together and we we're just like, okay, we gotta get this fruit in, we gotta, you know, do what we normally do. Um, once the evacuation orders had been lifted, um, we trucked the juice up to Cade and fermented it all at Cade. Um, so, uh, you know, I still had some tanks fermenting um, at that time during the evacuation, and um, I kept, tr you know, checking the the internet and the maps to see when is it going to open because so I you had couldn't to, get up here. I couldn't get up here, no. Um, but I kept checking to see, like, how can I get up there? Because I've got stuff fermenting and it needs some attention. And fortunately, the winery had power um, during that fire. On the second fire, we didn't, but we had power on that first fire, so it could keep the fermentation at a normal temperature, mm -hmm. 50, 55 degrees. Mm -hmm. But I still wanted to check it and make sure it was That's going. Your baby. It was my baby. Yeah. So um, Alejandro, our vineyard manager, calls me and he says, I've got a way to get up there. I'm like, how? He's like, just, I'm going to come pick you up and we'll drive up there together. So I was like, okay, uh, let's go. So I literally followed him through a vineyard. Um, we kind of snuck around the... Okay, don't tell anybody, <laughs> y'all. The, uh, the CHP and, and the barricades, and we kind of skirted around them. And literally, we could see fires in some vineyards, some trees on fire, you know, um, we passed some fire trucks that were putting out spot fires, and I was like, oh my gosh, this might be a bad idea. Or <laughs> right. I was like, oh my gosh, Alejandro and I are going to get arrested, and we're going to get you know, thrown in jail immediately. Arrested, caught on fire. Yeah. Right, you didn't think that but through, I maybe. I didn't think it through yeah. very well. So anyway, we, we got up there safely. Alejandro wanted to irrigate the vineyard, so he, he got in there to irrigate. I was like, don't leave me. I gotta go check my ferment. Like, we're buddies, we're, you know. And I did my, um, my nutrient ads and checked on the ferments and everything was fine. And we both looked at each other and we're like, let's get out of here. And we left and um, I didn't go back up until, um, I think it was like five days later that I've, I went back up when it finally opened. So, so that was after, so that was the fruit so the Pope Valley fruit was here, and then some fruit was at Plum Jack? Right. Um, so then, you know, once the, the, the smoke had cleared and the all, all good, we, we basically went and sampled everything, all of the fruit that we had still out on the vine because we were testing for a smoke taint. Mm -hmm. um, and we sent uh, samples to a laboratory in Canada to um, check for a smoke taint. We also did little micro ferments. Um, so basically picked about five gallons of fruit, crushed it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, fermented it, uh, and then sent the dry wine to the lab in Canada mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, to detect see if we had any smoke taint. And um, we had pretty much confirmed that, you know, the vintage was lost, but then we had another fire, the Glass Mountain the fire. The vintage was lost, not the Sauvignon Blanc vintage. Not the Sauvignon Blanc, Because no. you had picked all that. The Sauvignon Blanc was already in the door and picked. The red fruit was lost. Yeah. Um, so the red vintage, we didn't harvest any red grapes in 2020. Um, because we had yet another fire, the Glass Mountain Fire. Um, I feel like that's the one that got us on the red grapes. Well, it, it, it nailed, it was the final nail in the coffin, yeah. basically. Um, that one was very close to us. It actually came right up this um, canyon that we have here at 13th Vineyard. Um, about 100 yards from where we're sitting, um, the fire came up and... Fortunately, uh, you know, our property was fine. Our Amazing. vineyards were fine. Um, you know, all of our staff was um, safe. But um, it was a pretty devastating and, and damaging fire um, well, for back, up here. I mean, back to the Sauvignon Blanc. The fact that, uh, 
I mean, is it too dramatic to say you risked your life to come check the ferments? <laughs> well, the, no. I mean, I, I um, you would have turned around, I not driven through fire. Okay, because if I okay, felt because, at all in danger. Okay, but. good. But I mean, I don't know if y'all noticed what she said. You snuck through the vineyards around the police. Back. I mean, we shouldn't tell anybody that. <laughs> Just to come check the, the ferments. And I really, I mean, to me, that's the difference between good and great. That kind of passion and dedication to excellence, to check, it, it's just not something that shows up in the tech sheets, but it shows up in the glass. Well, I think um, what I should explain is that um, once you start the fermentation, once things get rolling, um, it doesn't stop just because it's Sunday or it's right. eight o'clock at night right. or there's a fire. Right. And so the yeast need sometimes a little bit of attention um, because things can go wrong. Um, the yeast might be like, hey, I don't like this environment. I'm gonna stop fermenting. And the next thing you know, you have um, sweet Sauvignon Blanc that's going turning to vinegar or it might smell like rotten eggs or um, that would you not know, be burnt delicious. rubber, and those are not good things. <laughs> no. And those aren't things that I can fix easily, um, and, and that would show up in the glass, and that's not what we want. So um, I didn't want to risk losing what could have potentially been our only Sauvignon Blanc that right. we picked. Right. Um, we, of course, did pick everything, but I didn't know that at that time, really. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to make sure we had something and protect it. So it's just, uh, you have to kind of keep monitoring it to, to make sure it's happy and healthy and, and finishes and, and makes a really nice glass of wine. You know what, Danielle, it's not just. <laughs> it's, it's exceptional. It's exceptional. So it turned out pretty good, pretty despite well, all that. Well, I, I think we have a question. Do we have a question? Uh, Sloan wants to know, Danielle, if you are enjoying each of these wines in your kitchen, what are you pairing with them in cooking? Ooh, well, good question. Um, I do love the fish taco idea. I think that's amazing. I do love Sauvignon Blanc and fish, so I totally agree with that. Um, I also just love Sauvignon Blanc with a great cheese. Oh. Um, you know, even like a blue cheese or a brie or even a, a truffle, something with a little bit of truffle. Mm. Oh, a, you know, a nice cheese board uh, is sometimes the best way to go for me. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think the secret is anything you squeeze a lemon over. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we have our first candidate. Sounds like uh, one may be ready to present. All right. Miss Christine Mason. All right. Oh, she's got to oh. make sure it's Oh, she's got to make the plates right. <laughs> I mean, I don't blame her. Uh oh, We're uh -oh. very tough critics oh, here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, you have your fish taco with the... Oh, my gosh. Oh. Side of shishito peppers. My wow. mouth is watering. Looks like I feel like, amazing. how do they do it on Chopped and make it look so easy? I know. Can you guys see this? This looks great. I don't know if you could say, oh, don't, look, don't <laughs> spill it. Okay, wait, hands okay. or fork? I'm what doing fork. Hands, I'm doing fork. Shit. Oh, okay. So I'm going to go for the hands. Mm. Oh, my gosh. It's so good. Mm. Oh, that's a perfect pairing. So is it, uh, Christine, is it cod? Yes. I really like the peach salsa. I think that brings out a lot of freshness. Oh, and it's a great It goes pairing. really great with the, with the wine. Brooklyn, are y'all jealous? Yeah. <laughs> mm. <laughs> mm. We're going to feed the studio live audience. I know. <laughs> yes. And the, the coleslaw has a really nice creaminess, mm -hmm. too. So it's, it's a really nice kind of way to bring some weight, mm -hmm. I think, to the wine, because the, I guess the worst thing about food and wine pairing is that you don't want to, you don't want the food to overpower the wine. I don't. Yeah. But sometimes the chefs like to overpower the wine, right? Because they're like, I need all this flavor and spice and, mm -hmm. and sweetness, uh -huh. and, right? And then the yeah. you know, you're like, wow, the wine tastes the horrible. Gone. Yep. But um, this is a really nice balance, I think. 
Well, that is often the common thread that I am trying to balance between my amazing chefs that we sell to you and my amazing <laughs> winemaking family. <laughs> And what I've found is the best pairing is the wine makes your mouth water, right? It pairs your pa prepares your palate for a bite or a sip. And then when you have the bite, it just explodes. And that's the perfect marriage. Yeah. I think. I mean, this Anthony, I know I think, that you're a professional, uh, but this is going to be hard to talk. I think we're going to need the recipe, Christine. So mm -hmm. we're going to have to mm -hmm. share that with everybody. Now, uh, Christine... Don't forget your mic. Do we have to have a, a grill to do this, or could you do this on a cast iron skillet? You could definitely do it on cast iron. I mean, this really is just a big cast iron grill or skillet. Um, the th reason I like it is because of the flavor. It really infuses so much flavor and so much seasoning, um, gives a nice char to the fish, but also um, and, and you can cook at a high heat, and it, it's just great. But, I mean, you don't even need cast iron you really can just you could bake this you really? could put it on a, a regular skillet i think that's what i did pre-griddle days but you know now that i have this this is all i do nice <laughs> anthony are you ready I'm ready. okay right. now i'm not giving this up i'm gonna i'm gonna no. rest this on your barrel yes let's put it on the barrel I'll cover it with a cade napkin and rest it on the barrel <laughs> don't give it up oh, mm -mm, I need it, but... oh you want to just put it here yeah Okay. Dylan. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> we're <laughs> we're <laughs> easily pleased, I guess. <laughs> that's a good thing. I think that's good. What do we have, Anthony? You have to you have to tell us what we're about to enjoy. So you have um, an egg-based asparagus crab uh, crab cake. Uh, it's got a little bit of um, citrus aioli that I used, grapefruit zest and lemon zest, uh, some toasted sesame oil, um, a little bit of uh, red pepper, and then there's a nice crisp up round of pancetta there to add a little bit of uh, crunch and some saltiness, and yeah. All right. Yeah. Here we go. Mm. 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 Mm-hmm. Very good. Let's see if it works. Mm. I, I have to have another bite. To be sure. To be sure. Yeah, I understand that. Mm. I think so. Now, Anthony, uh, asparagus was a brave choice <clears throat> for seven years long. Yes. What, what, uh, what, come over here so I don't have to. D <laughs> what made you, what made you choose asparagus? That is, um, that's the kind of the, the recipe that, like I said, my family always used. It was always asparagus. And I think that um, when the asparagus is fresh, it's not too overly bitter or anything like that. And it kind of can pair very nicely with a Sauvignon Blanc. When, when I first heard what you were cooking, I was wondering what would happen mm -hmm. here. And it's delicious. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm and I think it's it. the balance with the crab. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, the crab adds some sweetness to it. Um, it's Maine crab, so it's not California crab. Um, which tends to be a little bit saltier. So ah. the sweetness from that kind of adds a little bit to it as well. I think it makes the, the fruit kind of stand out a little bit more. I do too. And the, the spice um, is just perfect. And it also kind of lifts the acidity too. I think both dishes did that. Nice. Yeah. Really. yeah. Yeah. They were really honorable. They were honoring the wine <clears throat> as well mm -hmm. without being, without standing back. Yeah. Yeah. And the asparagus, you know, because... The winemakers don't want to have the wine taste green, right. or at least I don't. Mm -hmm. So that's always tricky, but I think you did a good job mm -hmm. with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you. it's not overpowering for sure. And I think when you shave them down like that and they're fresh so you don't cook them either. Um, oh, kinda, these are raw? Yeah, they were oh. raw right in there. So oh. yeah, it's a little different as well. Very good idea. Hmm. Could be the secret sauce. There it is, the secret sauce. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, um, are you, what do you think about the 2020 <clears throat> the end? After all the work you did, sneaking through vineyards, going around fires, how does it taste? Well, I get a lot of um, apple and a little bit of melon, like um, green melon. Um, I think there's a really nice acidity and, oh, thank you, um, crispness to it. There's um, that texture in the mid palate. There's just a little bit of softness there. 
um, which is from the barrel component. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a little bit less grapefruity and a little bit more apple, melon, uh, lemon. Agreed. So, which I like. Yes. And there's a little bit of a floral note as well, which is great. I like that in Sauvignon Is Blanc. that the Viognier and the Sauvignon? Mm-hmm, and the Sauvignon Musquet. Mm, of course, yes. Yep. Oh, do we have a question? Yes, Danielle, since we are talking about the 2020 Vintage, can you tell us when it will be released to our fans out there? Well, I think it's coming soon, right, Sandra? Well, it is on trucks as we speak, rolling across the country to some market. So it will be the next uh, vintage uh, available as, uh, as we transition. Yes. So 19 is going out, 20 is coming in, and uh, you won't be disappointed. The best thing is uh, we won't have a, a gap, not even for a week, which we've had in the past. And I've had to say, Danielle, Danielle, we need more. We need more. Is it too soon? Can we send it? Yes. Well, um, the thing about the two vintages really is that it's the same vineyards, the same winemaking, the same approach. Um, wine is not a cookie cutter recipe. Um, as hard as I try to make the same identical wine year after year, it's just really impossible to do. Mother Nature plays such a huge role in what we're tasting in the glass. Um, and especially in 2020, it was proven. But, um, you know, I, my approach to winemaking and um, especially the Sauvignon Blanc is to let the vineyard speak to you. If the vineyard is giving you lemon, make the best lemon meringue pie you possibly can you're never gonna take that lemon and turn it into apple pie. Right. It's just not gonna work. So um, the vineyard really dictates a lot of what we're tasting in the glass. I, as the winemaker, am just there to guide the wine to its, you know, ultimate- She's being humble. Finished <laughs> product. <laughs> um, no, but it's true. And, and so picking, picking decisions are your number one um, the minute you pick those grapes, it really starts the clock. It, 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 it starts the path of that wine. Um, and it's very hard to kind of shift it uh, off of that direction because you can't put the grapes back on the vine, right? right? Um, but there are a few things that happen along the way. The yeast that you use, the barrels that you use if you're using barrels, um, you know, how much Viognier or, or Semillon you add to the blend that is going to impact what you taste. And of course, um, you know, my goal is, is to make great wine, not vinegar. So I'm not in the business of making vinegar, and so I don't want to make vinegar. So it's about sanitation and a clean cellar and, and making sure that wine um, is, is stable and, and solid and doesn't go down a bad path. So that's really my job. And sneaking around fires. And zero and, fires. And yeah. uh, breaking into the winery. <laughs> I, did, I had the key. Um. Well. <laughs> but I, I think another thing to talk about, a lot, of, a lot of, I mean, essentially, one would call Cade a Cabernet house. Mm -hmm. And yet, we make this extraordinary Sauvignon Blanc. And I think something that I want to point out and give a red real hat to you is some Cabernet houses kind of turn and burn their Sauvignon Blanc, get it out fast. Uh, but you seem to speak as passionately about Sauvignon Blanc as you do about Cabernet. Oh, sure. I, I love Sauvignon Blanc. Don't get me wrong. This is what I want to be making. Um, I am, I'm not really a Chardonnay girl. I've made Chardonnay, but my true well, you passion like, you is... You like Aaron Chardonnay. I do love yeah. Aaron Chardonnay. The Plum Jack Chardonnay is amazing. <laughs> um, the only one I drink. And the Odette Reserve. Except for Odette. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but so I think it comes from my experience in Alsace. I worked as a harvest intern um, at a place called Domaine Sip Mac in Hunavir, Alsace. And, um, you know, those, those wines are the Riesling, Gewürztraminer, very floral, yes, very aromatic. pure, very aromatic wines, high acid, mm -hmm. high, you know, minerality. And I just, I loved them. I loved working there. And I um, learned a lot from the winemaker Jacques, who was kind of like, it all starts in the vineyard. 
I am just the caretaker. It, it's not about me. It's about where these grapes are grown. Um, and you're the, you're the steward. You are the one to guide these wines. And um, I just remember during harvest, I, in my recollection, it rained every day during harvest. <laughs> And I'm like, Jacques, pick the grapes, pick the grapes, it's raining. And he's like, we got this. Like, I know what I'm doing. It's, but it's fine. But told you. But David, yeah, UC Davis, where I got my degree in viticulture and enology, would have been like, uh, pick the grapes, you right. know. And um, so anyway, I, I learned a lot about just respecting the terroir, the place that the grapes are grown, um, but also just respecting that um, the the fruit is going to dictate a lot of what happens in the glass. And so I respect that. And I don't want to um, try to divert it and change it and make it mine and, yeah. you know, and put my, my thumb on it. Um, let it shine. Let it shine. Yeah. 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 So, so what happened with that vintage in Alsace? <laughs> It was a great vintage. It was lovely. But I do remember, like, like Botrytis um, does grow in those conditions. And they, do, they did make a, a botricized wine. Um, and I remember going to pick the fruit and um, seeing all these fuzzy grapes covered in mold and going, um, is this really going to make good wine? You know, I, this maybe, I don't know. And, and we brought the fruit in and, and dumped it into the hopper. And I just saw this plume of gray molds spurred out into the air. And I was like, this can't be good. <laughs> this is really <laughs> not going to be a good vintage. Was this your first vintage out of school? Or during yeah, this was my uh -huh. first okay. vintage out of school. And, uh, you know, of course, the winemaker Jacques was like, Daniel, it's okay. We got this, um, you know, and, and he had his, not tricks, but he knew what he was doing and, and the wine turned out great. And for all of my fears and, you know, running to a go, are you sure you want to do that? <laughs> it was uh -huh. like, okay. <laughs> but anyway, I, um, I love Sauvignon Blanc as a grape. I drink it often, the wine often, and um, I just like to, to showcase what it can, what it can do. Yeah. So. What I love about this wine is it is not one dimensional. And we started the conversation by talking about uh, the diversity of the Napa Valley and Southern Napa Valley really brings that grapefruit. And as we work our way north, you get Meyer lemon. And then even further north, as it gets warmer, the opposite of the US uh, because of the Pacific, um, you get all that peach and apricot. And even I'm getting some Maybe or orange blossom for yeah. sure. Yeah. Some white pepper, a little spice. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't. I do think it's respecting the vineyard. But I also think you're a talented winemaker. <laughs> um, the attention to detail in fermentation makes it softer on the palate. The t the attention to detail with. I heard a rumor that you've got a yeast obsession in terms of how many strains. Oh, anywhere from like, I don't know, 12 to 14 different strains of yeast. Now for, I'm sorry, so some of y'all might think this is interesting. Some of y'all be like, I don't know what she's talking about. But what, what does that do to a wine? Well, it's about um, the, the different conditions that you're fermenting in. So we ferment some of the juice in the concrete eggs. Um, and the eggs don't have any refrigeration. We, we ferment in the cave. So whatever the temperature of the cave is, which is, you know, 58 to 59 degrees, that's what that is going to ferment at plus some because we can't um, chill it down. So you want a yeast that's not a super fast fermenter because you want it to ferment a little slower so it doesn't get too hot, so it doesn't blow off all those aromatics. Mm -hmm. And then um, the same is true for barrel ferments. Um, you want a, a, a yeast that isn't too foamy, um, that doesn't ferment too quickly, that um, you know will also tolerate maybe cooler temperatures and a wider temperature range because we put the the juice down in the barrel at 50 degrees, and then um, as it's fermenting, it might get up to 65 or, or 68 degrees. So there's a lot of factors that are coming into it. But, but really, the, the main thing is 
all the yeast is um, purchased yeast, and they send out these glossy catalogs. <laughs> <laughs> and I flip through them like you're, you know, looking at the Pottery Barn catalog. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, that looks amazing. And then, you know, you read it and it's like it was isolated from South Africa and it has all these great characteristics. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> so that's pretty much how it, how it turns out. So then I can't say no, and then I end up with 14 different yeast strains. And what we end up with, we end up with, is complexity. <laughs> right. Yeah. I think not just complexity, but it sounds to me like you're taking these specific yeast to make sure that you're lifting the place, the grapes from the place, right. to its highest potential. Right. And some, some yeasts are specific at releasing thiols, which is kind of that floral musque mm -hmm. aroma. So for the Somio musque that we get from Oakville, I want a thiol releasing yeast that's gonna enhance all of that floral musque character. So that's part of it. And I well. thought it was just the vineyards. It is also <laughs> a little bit about our winemaking <laughs> techniques. We have a question, I see. The audience would like to know who had the better pairing today. Oh, well, yes, I guess we have to reveal our... our uh, well, what did you think? Um, I actually, I, I think I prefer Christine's dish. Well, I mean... Oh, uh-oh. Uh -oh. No, well, what did you uh -oh. think? What well, was your well, favorite? Well, who else is a super taster? You are. Oh, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like them both. Well, I, I do like them both. I think that's a, I mean, I think it's a tie for me. I think me. it's a tie. All right, it's a tie. You've convinced me. I mean, I think it's the, a tie. Danielle, the problem is you're Sauvignon Blanc. Why? Because it goes with everything. <laughs> that's true. I mean, that's really the problem, y'all. I, I can't decide. I thought you were going to say Anthony, because you were just like, oh, it's so amazing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, but I, well, you know. Okay, it's a tie. 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 it's a tie, you guys. And really what it speaks to is, you know, you can't mess this wine up no matter what you pair it with. Now, it's Mother's Day this weekend. Mm. I'm not allowed to tell you the story of how we named Blake. Uh, but, uh, and I won't. We'll save that for the next one. Um, what are you doing? Are you going to celebrate Mother's Day? Of course. I'm going to take my mother and my mother-in-law out to Angel in Napa, right on the riverfront there. If you guys haven't been to Angel, it's a great French restaurant. They've been in business for a long time. Um, they are amazing at what they do. And so we're going to do brunch with the mothers um, at Angel, one that of my favorite restaurants. Fun. And of course, my dad is French, so he can he loves it and he's always like you want to do Angel? yeah let's do Angel. so is your mom is your mom french too my mom is irish but um she's she's a very good cook mm -hmm. so she does a very good um fr she has a very good french repertoire of we talked, recipes we talked about super tasters yeah but <laughs> on the spot. how did you determine that you were a super taster yeah, well, okay, so super tasters are about 5% of the population, and they are people that can taste um, the bitter, umami, sweet, salty um, acid at lower levels than the rest of the population. So um, my first day in the sensory class at wine sensory class at UC Davis, uh, taught by Professor Ann Noble, um, she handed a little strip of paper to every student as they walked in the class and she said, put that strip on your tongue. And we all did that and we all, I would say 95% of the class went, Ew! and we taste this really bitter compound. And it's um, a strip that you can buy on Amazon, super taster, you know, test strip. And if you can taste this really bitter, um, not pleasant flavor at all, you are considered a super taster. So, is it um, genetic? <laughs> it's genetic, yes. Um, <laughs> and in fact, for my parents, um, I think it was their 45th wedding anniversary, because you know they're like, 
I gave Danielle the super taster gene. <laughs> and my dad being French, he's like, no, it was me. It's the French. <laughs> and um, so I was like, okay, for your anniversary, we're gonna, I'm getting the test You're going to cause a fight for the and, mom uh, their anniversary. Oh, no. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> so I like hand them the strips and I didn't really tell them. I just said, put it on your tongue. And my dad's going, hmm kind of tastes like paper. And my mom's like, eh, hey, you know, and just like, was like, that was better. And I was like, okay, came from mom, came from mom, <laughs> definitely did not come from dad. And to this day, my dad is really upset about it. He's just like, this can't be right. I'm the French one. Like, that is my, so funny. my grandparents were, had a vineyard in France, you know, so he's, he's not very happy about it. But I'm pretty sure my son, Blake, is also a super taster. Really? Yes. And yes. what evidence do you have of that? Um, he's, well, he's a little picky about some stuff, you know? So there, he's like, that's too spicy. And that, he doesn't really know bitter, but he'll just be like, everything is spicy. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like, well, my husband's a super taster, too. So, so it's chances, got are, a, pretty, chances, chances are, good. are pretty good. He's a super taster. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But he does like chocolate, so, you know, <laughs> it's good. Huh. Well, that might prove that he's a super <laughs> yeah. taster. So this is the first time I'm having the 2020. And? Wow. Good. Wow. Y'all, seriously, I mean, the 19's really good, too, but you don't have to be sad. That's really how we, we started off the, the, the show today was that we were almost sold out of 19, but thank you for fighting fires and... <laughs> Um, I did nothing. Risking arrest. Cal Fire did everything. Cal Fire did everything. I mean, they I, are the the heroes. They are. They remain our heroes. Yes, for sure. Um, I, what I love about it is it is not that intense grapefruit. It is all those flavors that you're trying to capture. Man, you did peach, apricot, stone fruit, lemon, lime, a little minerality even, yeah, and a, ba a bit of spice. This is a Napa Valley Sauvignon Blanc, and I think that's what I like to tell people is that I'm not trying to emulate um, somebody else's Sauvignon Blanc. This is taking the fruit that we work with and um, bringing the best out of that fruit, and it's really representation of Napa Valley, of all these sub-appellations, Pope Valley, St. Helena, Oakville, Oak Knoll, Howell Mountain. And um, I'm lucky to be able to work with fruit from all these different areas because I think it really brings out a lot of the grape. Um, but, you know, it's, it's rooted in, in Napa Valley. Um, yeah. This is not, it doesn't taste like New Zealand. It doesn't taste like France. Um, it doesn't taste like Italian Sauvignon Blanc. This is really just um, what Napa Valley can do with this grape. So. Yeah. Well, it goes back to showcasing terroir, lifting place to mm -hmm. its highest potential. Right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, nice work. Cheers. Cheers. I don't know how much left in my glass. Oh, no. But, uh, <laughs> well, should we, uh, should we see what they like? I us? think so. What, what about our chefs back here? What? <laughs> oh, don't forget your microphone. You want me to hold your microphone? Do you think that the Sauvignon Blanc worked well with your dish, Christine? I'm about to find out, but I, I have no doubt that this wine, which pairs with literally anything, uh, will be lovely with this. And what do you, how, how, did, how did you uh, fare with the Sauvignon Blanc? Um, I, thought, I thought it went very well. Um, I thought everything kind of worked pretty. I'm pretty excited for this fish. Okay, all right. We won't, we won't. We won't uh, listen to the crunch. <laughs> the crunch might be the good, the good sound. Let me get a little more. Uh, for some reason, this just went so quickly. Danielle, I'm not really sure. Some, oh. is, there a, is there a hole in your? Is there a hole in the I, glass? Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I tell y'all the trouble this might with be a trouble. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> thumbs up. Thumbs up. We thumbs got a thumbs up. up. Oh, I don't need the microphone. Yeah, leave it there. <laughs> Once again, um, we have been doing these Facebook Lives and Zooms and uh, programs just to kind of be with y'all on a Friday night. I hope that you enjoyed our um, 
cooking show from home, basically. <laughs> yeah. And um, just know that we don't get to do this uh, without you. I feel confident to say the Sauvignon Blanc really goes with anything, Danielle. I think so, yes. Yeah, you, you can't go wrong. Uh, and we don't get to do this without you. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for enjoying our wine from time to time. Uh, cheers. Cheers. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Christine and nice Anthony, job, for great food.